Thank you, first of all, to all of you who chose this panel to attend. Um, I'm glad that there are some uh, faces um, and people who are going to listen to me. And I will be speaking today on cinematic actresses in Jonathan Coe's fiction um, with a focus on lost films. Um, hmm. Oh. Okay, um, I will briefly introduce the cinematic actresses and its connection to media transformation. We'll shortly speak about lost films um, and their media characteristics and dedicate hopefully most of my time to the analysis of the um, House of Sleep, one of Jonathan Cole's novels. Um, the analysis is um, aimed at answering the central question of how the lost film and its media characteristics are transformed in another type of medium, the novel, um, and draw a conclusion on whether cinematic accuracy is a blend of media representation and transformation of media characteristics. Some of you might recognize accuracy as a um, description of a work of art, um, others may be familiar with a very influential um, definition uh, of accuracy by James Heffernan as the visual representation as the verbal representation of visual representation today however accuracy is more and more perceived through the lens of intermediality where it is defined as an intermediate reference the representation of a source medium in a target medium or a kind of intermediate transformation by acquiring the attribute of adjective cinematic Acrisis engages with films as its source or target medium. In the slide, you can see um, my definition of cinematic acrisis, which is based on the conception of acrisis in intermediate studies. Since the subject of my analysis today is fiction, novels in particular, the definition is adjusted to refer to film medium as the source medium in cinematic acrisis. And as such, one way or another, film the film medium undergoes transformation, judging at least by the fact that the medium of film is completely different from the medium of literature or the medium of the novel in every modality and mode. If accuracy means transformation, one naturally asks how the media in accuracy can be transformed. And in the attempt to answer this question, I turn to um, Lars Ellström's work on media, media transformation, in which he singled out two types of it the transmediation of media characteristics and representation of media. While the former refers to repeated mediation by another type of medium, the media representation means the notion of one medium that represents another type of medium. And as you can see in the schematic diagrams on the screen, in the case of transmediation, the target medium represents the same media characteristics as the source medium. And in the case of media representation, the target medium represents the source medium, which is here, but only referring to the media characteristics of the target medium. Um, and although transmediation and representation are very interrelated, and they are, however, usually um, exemplified by different uh, practices, thus transmediation is usually exemplified by film by any kind of adaptation, for example, film adaptation of a novel, um, and media representation is usually exemplified by accuracies. Um, as I mentioned, they are very closely interrelated and according to Alice Trump, transmediation always includes some amount of media representation and similarly, media representation can also involve transformation. Thus, it happens when um, media representation involves repeated mediation of this, the equivalent sensory configurations. Um, in other words, if the target medium mediates sensory configurations that are equivalent to the sensory configurations of the source medium. And in this paper, I will try to show that um, cinematic actresses of lost films, this is my focus, can be an example of both representation and transmediation of media characteristics. The reason for that is not only their interrelatedness, but also the specificity of the um, um, lost films, the subject of cinematic actresses in uh, my paper, and by 
specificity of the submedium of lost films, I mean their media characteristics um, or the features of lost films that are apprehended and formed when we make sense of the mediated sensory configurations. And since media are groupings of media products, I took several examples of lost films in my attempt to construct an adequate overview of the media characteristics of lost films. So I try, to put it simply, I just took some lost films examples and tried to get an overview of the features that they contain. And in the slide here, you can see one of such examples that um, I engaged with. Uh, probably the most prominent example of the media products of lost films, London After Midnight. Um, the last known copies of the film got lost in a fire at the studio some 70 years ago. And, uh, um, but London After Midnight is still considered to be the holy grail of um, lost films that a lot of people are searching for. Um, as you can see, um, three posters, one of them is here, several library cards, 19 film steals, and the full film script are actually preserved and available to everyone online. Everyone can um, find them anytime they want. Um, but paradoxically, people keep looking for it, trying to visualize what's in the film and trying to uh, find the reel to actually watch the film. With this in mind, can we conclude what, we can, what can we conclude about the media characteristics of lost films? I took the li liberty <laughs> of um, outlining at least three aspects um, as media characteristics of lost films. First of all, lost films do not have a material manifestation typical for normal films or existing films. What Elistrom calls the material modality of media is completely different for um, lost films. The corporeal interface of lost films are photographs, stills, film scripts that are preserved. But if they are not preserved and are not available, then lost films exist purely as narratives, oral or written. Secondly, uh, the main lost films tend to change the nature of the main purpose of the film medium. Instead of to be watched, um, they are meant to be found first in order to be watched. And finally, lost films create a very strange, uncanny feeling about them because, first of all, lost films position themselves between familiarity and unfamiliarity. And by that, I mean that since there are stills, film scripts, photographs that are available, we kind of know what the films are about, but we have not seen them. So we are familiar with them, but are not really familiar. Um, closely connected to this is the duality um, of presence and absence. Lost films make themselves present through the stills, film scripts, again, any, any evidence preserved. But on the other hand, they do not exist in their physical manifestation, as I already mentioned. And finally, the duality of life and death um, is present. As, by, by that, I mean that um, since, despite the fact that most lost films had gone lost, um, because their film reels were destroyed or for whichever reason, um, they nevertheless stay kind of alive through the narratives that we build around them, and they're still very present. Of course, lost films possess other media characteristics um, more than these ones. I just try to, you know, <laughs> outline um, the most obvious ones, so to speak. And as I mentioned, the uncanny, I just wanted to refer very briefly to the understanding of it as the feeling of something not simply weird or mysterious, but more specifically as something strangely famili familiar. The uncanny is, however, much more. Um, it is a strange feeling of things falling into place, of things being fated, meant to be, or uncertainty, deja vu, and many, many, many other things. As I turn to the examples of cinematic actresses, now I will try to show which aspects of the uncanny are also represented and transmediated in the House of Sleep, the, um, what my analysis is based off. Uh, many of Jonathan Coe's novels deal with films, and uh, several of them deal with lost films in particular. The House of Sleep tells the story of Terry, Robert, and Sarah, who used to study at the university together, but after that fall apart, go different directions. 
And what unites them now is a lost film, Le Trinjuci, uh, by Salvatore Ortese. Um, Terry searches for the film, but finds only a still from it. The still depicts the same scene that Roberts once saw in a dream. He treats the dream as a guideline to change his sex and become a woman. He becomes a woman under the name Cleo, and by doing so, he tries to fix his twisted relationship with Sarah. And the still again, or the dream, magically instructs him how to find her, where to find her, and how to do that. The first means of representation of lost films is the narration of the events happening to people who had actually the chance to watch the film before it gone lost, apparently. The ironic stories of the curious accidents from people's lives after watching the lost film create a humorous effect, first of all, but then just simply an absurd situation in which the film has such a strong effect, of pe on, effect on people that, as I mentioned in the screen, people commit suicide, they experience memory loss, or they commit to the vow of silence in, um, in monasteries. And my favorite example here in the slide again, about a representative of an Italian distribution company who had seen the film, while he adamantly refused to disclose the content, he had forever afterwards suffered from a bizarre bladder complaint, which made him unable to urinate in the company of other men, tragically. Furthermore, going further, um, the lost film is represented by means of description of one of the film stills or Roger's dream simultaneously. And um, the connection between the still and the dream is never commented on explicitly in the novel. First, readers find Robert's dream at the beginning of the novel, describing a very arid landscape and the woman pointing off into the distance. However, 200 pages later, later, one finds almost identical description. A road, a dusty, arid landscape, and a woman, a woman in nurse's uniform, pointing off into the distance. But now the passage describes the film still, or a photograph from the lost film, and one cannot help but wonder how is it possible that um, the same description, which is supposed to be about a dream, now turns out to be the content of one of the film's scenes. Very curious coincidence, isn't it? Another example of the Steele's representation is the characters talking about the photograph, discussing the meaning behind the foreign word, fermé, and the discussion ends with a strange remark. I'm not saying it's the only meaning, it creates suspense as Cleo clearly knows more than she's saying and um, not only the sense of unfamiliar unfamiliarity remains, but the reader's feeling of uncertainty grows. Um, the uncanny effect of the representation here lies what um, Royal called the crisis of the proper because um, we don't know what is proper anymore. We don't know we see this remark and it puts everything said before into doubt, but Co doesn't offer any solution and leaving readers longing for any sort of explanation, but there are none. And instead of explanation, we get only more confusion and more reasons for the crisis to develop. The, vo the foreign word appears again in the novel in the appendix and this excerpt represents the transcript of one of Cleo's um, patients who is talking in her sleep. And magically, again, in her sleep, she mentions the same word, but referring now to a location in London, Fermer Road, the place where um, Cleo will find Sarah and reun reun reunite with Sarah and be happy together. Um, everything seems to be falling into place. And fate seems to be the only explanation, but um, how is that possible that the same still, the film still, refers to an actual location in London where things will fall into place and um, everything will make sense again, but nothing makes sense. And the uncanny actually never does, especially when things seem to be 
fated, the very core of the effect that cinematic actresses in the house of sleep keeps turning to. The examples of um, transmediation here, I will draw on three. And uh, um, as I said earlier, the dualities of familiarity and unfamiliarity, absence and presence, as well as life and death, appear on different levels of the narrative. The first thing that one notices is the chronological narration as each chapter narrates the events of the year um, 1983-1994 is followed by the chapters that narrate the events of the year 1996. And since the same characters are at the center of the events in both lime, uh, time frames, two time spans simply blend and um, they, try, they, they tend to be mixed the further one goes through the novel. Such type of narration continuously fills in the gaps in the plot's understandings while new questions keep appearing and readers find themselves simply torn between familiar and unfamiliar tiny details which are still relevant for the plot. Besides, each part of the novel finishes with a full stop, uh, not with a full stop, but rather in the middle of a sentence. And here there is an example of the end of one um, chapter, which finishes with, he had never thought. And the next chapter begins with the same word, thought that was something strange and so on and so forth. As the narrative of one chapter flows into the one of the next chapter, the familiar commingles with the unfamiliar and creates the sense of unsettlement. Going further, the duality of life and death is most clearly transmediated in the, on the level of character storylines. As I have mentioned earlier, Robert undergoes the sex reassignment surgery and uses the, same, uh, the name Cleo as a woman. So he's neither dead or alive, as in Robert, the man, is dead, but Robert or Cleo, the woman, keeps living. Similarly, um, as for Terry's storyline, um, there is the duality of life and death in the terms of that at the end of the novel, Terry leaves a train at a station and an accident of some sort happens to him. We don't know what it is as, as readers, but only in the appendix um, of the novel, the readers find out that he actually goes into coma. So again, the state between life and death is present here and neither of them, or at the same time, both of them prevail. Finally, presence and absence can be found in the theme and the whole thing of the novel, which is sleep. Um, the theme of sleep goes like a red thread through the novel and presence and absence are repeatedly mediated in the stages of wakefulness and sleep. And they are found in the division of the novel. From stage one, starting with the stage one, when one goes from wakefulness to drowsiness and ending with stage four, which resembles, which is the most restful part of the sleep. The novel finishes with REM sleep, which is a state of sleep or paradoxical sleep, which resembles more wakefulness than sleep. And by doing so, starting with the state of being present or conscious or awake, um, the house of sleep proceeds through four stages to the core sleep where the mind is no longer present or unconscious. But in the final stage, the REM sleep, one is awake again. So the presence is brought back and the novel goes from presence to absence and further on to presence. By representing the lost films, as I mentioned here, through the speculative narrative around the lost film, description or reference to the film's content, Cinematic actresses evokes the uncanny feeling, which is, however, is not identical to the familiar, unfamiliar duality of lost films. Although the uncanny effect, um, again, is um, connected to the media characteristics of lost films, um, the uncanny here in representation means more of uh, mystery, suspense, uncertainty, strangeness, or the feeling of fate. As for transmediation, by transmediating the media characteristics of lost films, the dualities of 
familia and familia, absence, presence, life, death. Um, the House of Sleep mediates the uncanny for the second time. And doing so through the narrated time, character storyline, and the general theme of the novel. When one tries to draw an example of representation or transmediation exclusively, one keeps failing because the two types of transformation are so closely interrelated. One could conclude that cinematic accuracy extends its operation or performance from representation only to the mediation of sensory configurations of lost films for the second time. As for the uncanny, it seems to be a truly transmedial characteristics, although media characteristics are stated to never be fully transmedial in Elistron's work, the model differences between the novel and lost film, as I studied that in my presentation, um, seem not to be a limitation for transmediation, but rather an effective tool for the novel to engage with the media characteristics of lost films. And thank you, first of all, for your attention. Thank you.